Hey there, Dave here along with Chris and Jordan. Happy Friday. Welcome to Dumb Money Live. It is a Friday live chat edition. We have a lot to talk about today from uh, Jamie Dimon sounding the alarm over persistent inflation uh, to gold hitting an all-time high, the uh, the government giving billions to Taiwan Simi for factories in Arizona. And of course, we, we definitely have to talk about Elon announcing a date for when robo-taxis are going to be unveiled. We're going to do all of that, and we're going to get to your questions in the live chat. But before we do, quick reminder, smash the like button. Let the almighty YouTube algorithm know that we're on. Uh, but I want to start with a tweet that I saw from you, Chris. You got back from Miami. You were at the Money Show. Let's start by having you tell us what exactly that is and uh, what your takeaways were. Yeah, I don't really know that much about the Money Show other than uh, they invited me to come out and talk. Uh you know, I spoke to a room full of people, had a lot of fun. Uh, I, I I also happened to meet some of my humanoid buddies down in Florida. They drove in three hours to meet with me at one of the guy's condos. Yeah, on, that's that's uh, what this picture is here. Be, yeah, dude, it, it was awesome, dude. We just spoke for like an hour and a half and geeked out about humanoids. It was it was fantastic. Like, you you know, I can't. Who's willing <laughs> to do that with me? That is your Barely dream you Florida vacation is just going and talking about humanoids with other people who are as nerdy as you are when it comes to robotics and the AI revolution. Yeah. And, and these guys talk about humanoids every day of their life. They're like, they're all in They're humanoid podcasters, uh, humanoid investors. Uh, they're invested in a bunch of the companies across the sector. But, you know, the money show is I don't do stuff like that very often because it, it's kind of weird when you fly across the country to talk to like 60 people in a room when we can uh -huh. reach tens of thousands just sitting in my closet. But I, I did broach a subject that I think is relevant for the, today's episode. And I kind of had this whole thing about how NFL players are dropping so many balls. Do you know that they drop like one out of every 20 passes? And when I say drop, I don't mean like drop because it was deflected or they had a defensive back on them like when the ball is in their hands with no defensive back touching them they just drop the ball uh in fact the chiefs had like a seven percent drop rate this year and i think there's a lot there's a lesson there that we could learn for investing because these are the strongest guys with the biggest hands that have been catching balls their entire life the, the elite the best of the best in the nfl and the first thing they teach you when you start playing football as a kid is watch the ball into your hands, right? And I think the problem is when you get to age 20, 25, you're in the NFL now, do you think these coaches, they're, they're afraid to tell these guys, like I tell my son before every game, I say, what is the one thing you're going to do this game? The only thing I'll get mad at if you don't do this, he goes, I'm going to watch every ball into my hand. Now, I think they're not telling Tyreek Hill before every time he goes out in the field, I if I was if I was coaching the Dolphins, I'd be like, "Hey, Tyreek, what are you going to do? I'm going to watch the ball into my hands." But I, and I swear, if you did that, I don't think thing, at that level. I don't. I think I think the coaches can't baby their players like that. I was really wondering where this analogy was going. No, but, but Dave, you have to because that they are missing. The NFL teams are dropping two open catches on average a game now. It's insane. That I estimated, I did some calculations, some napkin ca calculations. I'm estimating that if you could solve this one problem and bring the drop rate below 1%, which I know you can do simply by telling them every time they go on the field, what are we going to do? We're going to watch the ball into our hand because they're... They, that you could add one <laughs> to two wins a year. I think this is good for one to two wins a year. Okay. Extra You're wins money a year. balling football now. Yeah. Yeah. But here's the thing. But here's how we bring it back to Wall Street and investing. The problem is that there is so much noise. In fact, even my son, who's in eighth grade, when he has his private training, they are training him on the most intricate things, like as a receiver. Every single thing that you can come into contact with, like they're practicing plays where you're on the sideline and you're barely trying to catch a ball. Like they're teaching so much and they're, they're, there's so much going on that they're forgetting that the one thing that matters more than anything else is to watch the ball into your hands. And if you study these NFL players, because I've looked at a lot of tape now, 
almost every drop is the result of them not looking at the ball as it's going into their hands. Okay. And take it to investing. Yeah. Dude, so what we're are... investing, what is the equivalent of watching the ball into your hands? We are so consumed with all this BS, the, some of the stuff we're going to talk about today, inflation and all this crap that we're forgetting that the at the end, listen, we're social arb traders, right? So we really believe this. But the only thing that really matters, the only thing that actually matters as an investor, if you're trying to beat the market, is alpha. Like, what is the thing that you know that other people don't? That's it. The, the only thing that matters is alpha. And we get so consumed by all the financial news and all the politics and all the interest rate and the inflation and the BS and Jay Powell and the government that we don't allocate enough time to focus on, is there one big piece of information out there that people are just not seeing? It could be related to one random stock or a sector. And like, I fall for this myself, guys. Like I used to spend so much time just on this one thing. And occasionally now I get caught up in all the BS that I'm like, how much time did I actually spend this week looking for alpha? And it's like, not enough, not enough, okay? Because I'm consumed by all the BS. So I, 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 every once in a while, I want to remind myself, do not watch financial news. Do not read financial news. Do not think about it. Just stop. Stop checking stocks. I, I'm, I, I'm only allowing myself to look at my portfolio now like once, maybe twice a day. Like I can really like quickly check it and then, freaking get the hell out of there and go on with my day. Like stop staring at the damn portfolio. It doesn't make you money. It doesn't make you money. Like I understand you want to keep up to date with like the most important crap that's happening, but that shouldn't take more than a few minutes a day and just stop it. Get on with your actual methodology, whatever that is for most of our community. It's about finding one piece of information on a trend or a switch in consumer behavior, a hot product, a brand that's doing well, um, a technology that people aren't fully appreciating, trying to get fully uh, engaged with the next big winner in AI. And uh, because, dude, we've said this a billion times this year on this show, like with opportunity, <laughs> with opportunity, with change comes opportunity. And in my life, I have never seen so much change about to happen in the world than right this second. So there's more opportunity as investors right this second than there probably ever has been outside of maybe the one year of COVID when just if things were changing every day. And that was the best year of our career. Right. So get your head in the right place. That's what this episode's about. But I, I, we will talk about some of this other stuff briefly. I want to keep it brief. And then let's talk about the real crap that matters. And we'll ask you guys to, uh, if you're watching the live show, use the chat and we'll be going through and answering questions. Um, but AI changing everything can, can lead into, I, I brought a few topics. We can talk about whatever topics you want, but one of them is uh, Taiwan Simi expanding their Arizona factories. So huge. I think it was $6.6 .6 billion earmarked for that as a part of the 2022 uh, CHIPS Act. But this is new money that's being allocated to a private company to uh, ensure that uh, the U.S. doesn't get behind when it comes to actual production. Uh, their goal is to produce 20% of the world's fastest chips by 2030. Uh, they've been building facilities in Arizona since uh, 2021. So what is what does that do for Taiwan Simi, who builds all the chips anyway, getting them do, closer to home? Do you know that I almost had a heart attack when I that Taiwan earthquake happened? Dave, if that earthquake... I saw your tweet on that too, by the way. You were, if it was you, on you the, were quickly was doing a, like a geography lesson to educate yourself on where Taiwan Simi facilities are versus where the earthquake are. And luckily it happened to be as far away as possible. I, I had never factored that in. I'm such an idiot. Like not one second in my life did I realize that an earthquake in that other part of Taiwan, if it would happen, the other part would have completely destroyed my portfolio. It, it would have been 
the worst moment in my investment career. Could you even imagine if that went down with our portfolios right with now? Our portfolios this deep so impact? heavily weighted to the future of everything we do is powered by these chips that are coming out of one tiny corner of the globe. It's insane. It, this is so important that this, this Arizona news is so key. Um, it's so needed. We need actually like 10 X more than that. Like we need, we need more news like that. Just it, additional capacity because capacity is the one thing that's going to fuel the next decade of yeah technology growth you have to have capacity compute you have to have the capacity to support an exponential increase in compute which is the only thing that's going to save us <laughs> next decade is yeah. and I feel you know like it's kind of like the 90s when the capacity for bandwidth uh you know on dark fiber under the ocean was the concern. I feel like the compute power is our new concern, but eventually it becomes commoditized. But let's not talk about it like compute. It then the new industry is the industry of intelligence. That intelligence will become the largest industry we've ever known. Intelligence will become an industry that is larger than the energy industry. It will be an industry that is larger than human labor. Like the intelligence industry is going to be what people talk about the next 20 to 30 years. I know it's hard to wrap our head around that because like, what the hell does that even mean? But mm -hmm. to, to what do we need to fuel intelligence? Compute. That's what we need. And what do we need for that? Chips. You know, we need to be able to fabricate and better tech. Obviously, that's where NVIDIA falls in but jordan what what is, is this a big deal i know you've actually tracked uh taiwan semiconductor for what for years i know you've been focused on them you've liked them aren't you invested in them i've always looked at them um, yeah not nearly enough um but yeah no i mean they're a great company they're um i mean they're the leading they're on the kind of the bleeding edge of um uh, boundary and chip manufacturing. So, um, you know, the biggest problem with TSMC has always been, you know, any concern that China would come in and, you know, have any sort of, you know, conflict with Taiwan, right? And so that's kind of the major concern. So getting um, two things, one, getting, um, you know, getting them a facility, you know, up and running in Arizona would be enormous. Um, but also, will, the, will there be competition? I know Intel is looking to expand into foundries. So, um, yeah, it's uh, you know, it's definitely a place that we need to to focus in on. Down, yeah. What is it down four percent today? Um, I don't know. Is it? Uh, it's, it's it's down a little today, but it's. I yeah. mean, if you look at this one year chart, it's a uh, very strong stock. What's yeah, I think not... it would be even stronger if there weren't you know geopolitical concerns. Um, I think that would be everybody's top stock. So, Jordan, doesn't it does it worry you? that there's at least a 50-50 chance Trump becomes president. And if he does, that he that one of the first things he might do is ruffle up the whole China thing like he did last time. And that could cause more instability in that region and impact companies like this. I mean, is, is that a real concern, do you think? Well, like I said, I mean, that's always been, I think that's everybody's biggest concern with TSM always is that there could be, and it doesn't just have to do with Trump. I don't, you know, I, um, you know, he is definitely, uh, you know, adversarial there. I mean, he, you know, um, but, but when it, but comes is that, is, is, that gonna, is Trump going to cause, um, China to go invade Taiwan? I, you know, I don't think so. I, I think that I, just whatever latent, you know, issues that are going on there are, are kind of I, I don't concerned. I don't think it's that whole about them invading Taiwan I think the adversarial nature of his geopolitics will start do you remember how we were going day to day for like a year and a half yeah. on US China tariffs like companies were not able to make decisions because they had no clue what the repercussions were going to be on our geopolitical policy that was changing by the day. And even if that policy directly didn't impact a company or sector, 
the repercussions of the backlash of what China might do because of that policy. So like we would put tariffs on one class of goods and then is China going to come back and say, OK, well, now we're going to do this to harm U.S. companies yeah. in China. There was just a lot of unknowns. Yeah, well, I, we can, I mean, just because Trump's not in office doesn't mean we haven't had some of that happen anyways. I mean, we put some limitations on the types of chips that NVIDIA is allowed to send over to China, um, limitations on the H100s, um, you know, uh, and we saw little to no impact to NVIDIA stock based on some of those um, some of those things. Now, you know, their orders have been outstanding, so uh, maybe that's why, but I think that there's always concern in this, especially in this space where, you know, the United States wants to be ahead of the game in AI and in the hardware that drives it. Okay, let's just, I want to talk about Pal, uh, not Pal, Jamie Dimon, JP Morgan. This is this is the big story this week and part of yep. why people are, are crediting today's move down in the market. How worried should we be about his statements? Yeah, and, this, and the statement employees. came in his annual shareholders letter. This is something he does every year, and he made made a you know, a lot of different statements. But the one that people are paying attention to are this persistent inflation. Um, economic, he says, economic indicators continue to be favorable. However, looking ahead, we remain alert to a number of uncertain forces, including. He talks about uh, unsettling global landscape, wars and violence, geopolitical tensions, not just Taiwan, but the world that, that you know, yeah. to tie it into it's to our conversation. Um, but that uh, that there's a large number of persistent inflationary pressures, despite inflation falling considerably from its 9.1% peak, progress has largely flatlined since the summer. So in the past, I would have been concerned by something like that and would have hedged my portfolio and done various things. The truth is, when you think about that statement, is there anything about that statement or what he's claiming is a concern that would change in the next two, three, four years? No, the, these concerns are not going anywhere. Uh, we're going to be dealing with this stuff for a very long time. The geopolitical situations are not going anywhere. They're not going to resolve themselves anytime soon. The inflationary concerns, I don't see, correct me if I'm wrong, Jordan, you think about this stuff more than I do, but I do not see the inflationary concerns going away anytime soon. Like we're in this really weird place. We're always talking about it, the printing of money that we did, the interest on that money. It's like, <laughs> a cycle that it seems like it's really hard to get out of. And I just, as an investor, I can't allow this stuff to scare me because is it going to change a year from now, two years from now, three years from now? I don't think so. The market is going to figure this stuff out and work through it or it's not, but there's never been a time in history here where we haven't somewhat figured out how to deal with it and having you know, capital uh, allocated to assets hasn't ultimately been the better of two uh, scenarios if you have to look at, you know, not investing in assets or investing Yeah, I think, in yeah, you're right. And if we look at, especially on the inflation side, do you want to sit in cash while your, in, your money gets inflated away or do you want to hold on to assets? And are there going to be some ups and downs and people freak out when, you mm -hmm. know, there's inflation concerns? Yeah, sure. But, you know, we know what's going to happen to your dollar if you just sit on it. So I think you have to be in assets. Uh, and yeah, I think you're right. I, I think that we're in a space right now where people don't really understand why inflation keeps happening. Um, I think I've got a pretty good idea. Um, I could be wrong, but what 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 is your idea? Yeah. So the I mean the biggest drivers um, for inflation. I think if you look at just like you know what, what the biggest issue is, and it's it's government spending. Um, and it hasn't slowed down since the pandemic. So even though the Federal Reserve has hiked interest rates, um, payments on the debt are going up, we are still running um, recklessly, um, you know, on the fiscal side. And it's, 
um, it's that's what drives inflation, right? People think interest rates drive inflation. People think all sorts of things that drive inflation. They don't. It's um, and we learned this coming out of the seventies that what finally crushed inflation when you know when you had the Federal Reserve just cranking interest rates and cranking interest rates that finally the federal government just stopped running these huge uh, budget deficits and that at that point you know you saw an easing in inflation. Um, so as long as the government keeps spending more than they're bringing in, um, I think you're going to see this inflation problem stick around. But now, there's Jordan, all sorts of structural problems, right? So there's you know a lack of housing, right? So we're running uh, you know with with higher demand for housing than there is supply, and so those are kind of structural problems with inflation. You've got you know oil is a totally different animal, and so you see inflation on the energy side. Um, and, you know, some of those things I don't think are quite as affected by government spending, even though we've been filling the strategic reserve. But um, but yeah, for the, for the most part, I think your headline is the government spends too much money. But but Jordan, you know this. There's absolutely no way that that changes. It's it can't change. It won't change. Like there's right, no right. So as long as it's happening, I think I think inflation is here and higher interest rates are here. Yeah. So like the next two presidents, neither of them and neither of the current political parties are prepared to make any dent in that fiscal spending at all. Like it just it's not going to happen. So yeah. we basically now know that 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 problem will not get solved through budget cuts. So this is something we're going to have to deal with, live with. It's not going away. So is it there, there will still be winners and losers, right? I think it, it's really important as investors not to get paralyzed by this stuff. By the way, we're not financial advisors. We're just talking through how we think about this for ourselves, guys. Um, feel free to chime in in the comments here. I can't make any major rash decisions based on inflation because it's not going away. It's We're going to be dealing with it. I'd rather be investing in great assets uh, and they're still great assets to invest in, regardless of, of inflation. Which which brings me to another topic that we brought up at the beginning. I've been going through and starring some uh, of the questions that we'll get to in just a little bit. But huh, gold prices are at an all-time high. It, yeah. it, that is traditionally an inflation hedge. Um, spot prices for gold up 16%. The S&P is up around 10%. Uh, this is mainly driven by central bank purchases. Um, China has added 225 tons of gold to its reserves in 2023. Uh, it, that, that's more than any other central bank. It's now 4.3% of all of its reserves. But closer to home, Costco is selling $200 million worth of gold every month. Yeah, they that's are. That's the headline that, that, <laughs> that I saw this this afternoon. You know, we, we always forget, we, we talk about this $80 trillion of wealth transfer that's supposed to happen over the next 20 or 25 years. But we forget that the boomers still hold that eighty trillion dollars, right? Not all of it, but but a big chunk of it. So the wealth transfer hasn't happened yet. And who goes to Costco and buys gold? <laughs> it's those boomers, man. I'm telling you, Hot like dog fans like, and boomers. Now, I, now here's here's a thought. Why does Costco not also sell Bitcoin? Because they could sell a barcode that is like, or some kind of a, a coin right. that is preloaded with actual Bitcoin that you can unlock with with the key that's provided in the package or something. Like, wouldn't that be the way to Dude. to get to get the boomers to have a way to buy Bitcoin that are that if they can't figure out uh, opening up a Coinbase account? Oh my gosh! If we could figure out a way to white label. Bitcoin just for Costco. That, yes. That's, dude, that would be the thing. That would be it. That would be the thing for us. You know how every Bitcoin. time the media that's... talks about Bitcoin, they always show like a gold coin with a B logo on it. What if we actually made those, but had like an actual, you know, some sort of a barcode or some sort of just a key that, that actually contained the Bitcoin on a physical thing that you could unlock in a wallet? Oh, man. That that could be more impact. Selling Bitcoin at Costco might be more impactful than when Bitcoin started uh, selling through ETFs. It, it would it could be that big. It could be that big. <laughs> could someone make it happen, please. Someone out there, 
start a campaign to get Costco to start selling Bitcoin. <laughs> um, I think we I think we do forget that change happens slowly. We've talked about this as it relates to Bitcoin. Um, most of the institutions are still having meetings to figure out how they want to present Bitcoin to their customer base, most of Wall Street, right? They haven't even made their marketing materials yet for how they want to start to bring Bitcoin into wealth management. That process takes many months. It could take multiple years before it really starts to unfold. So I kind of thought Bitcoin was going to have a bigger move right now. I was wrong. Uh, it's, it seems to have a lot of resistance here. Uh, and it's probably due to the fact that we're just not see- inflows are good, but they're it's going to take time. It's just going to take time. Uh, I don't own any gold though, so I missed out on that move. <laughs> I I don't old in, own any gold other than the uh, gold credit card that uh, Robin Hood sent me. That is my yeah. entire supply of gold. Um, I do want to talk about the other thing you put in our headline, Dave. The robo taxi announcement of eight eight. I think I. I didn't buy into this. In fact, the second that I saw that announcement, I was waiting for Elon to do something because I feel that this is going to be a really tough period for Tesla. I'm not alone. Everyone's been saying it. The numbers just look terrible. The competitive pressure on the EV division of Tesla globally is getting tough right now. Uh, Inflate, you know, interest rates don't help at all. They're in a really bad spot in terms of their EV division. And I knew that Elon was going to try something. And I was just waiting to see what it was. And then he comes out and he announces this 8-8 date, which is enough in the future, right? Like it's yeah. it's yeah. many I'm months sure, in the I'm future. sure behind the scenes, they're scrambling, trying to see what they can actually show by 8-8. Uh, this came on I, the heels of like that Reuters report that he said was false about them scrapping the $25,000 vehicle. But since then it's kind of like the analysis is like, well, it's probably partly true. They're probably focusing the same platform that was going to be the low end car and the robo taxi. And they're probably going to, you know, they're not scrapping it, but maybe they're prioritizing it differently because they really want to get robo taxis out. What do you think of the chances that that tweet or whatever, I, don't, I forget how he put that out, probably over Twitter. I it was on X, yeah. Yeah, on X, that he just randomly thought of that and hadn't even thought about it until that <clears throat> moment, didn't talk to anyone and tweeted it out over X yeah, without I think, a I single think it's probably thought. like 80% chance that that is exactly what happened. It, it was all in his head. He kind of like, he knew where the progress was and what he when he might be, able to show something when he could at least get on stage with a, you know, remember the first time he showed an optimist, it was a a guy in a a costume. So like, I don't know that we're going to see a functional robo taxi on eight, eight. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we're not going to see a functional robo taxi on eight, eight. What we're going to see is a design, a rendering, maybe a functional model that isn't uh, driving people around, but yeah. So I actually, he has, I I don't know if you saw the job postings that came out this last week for basically, it looked like, like robo taxi operators in the dozen or so cities that they're looking to start testing robo taxis in. So Mm -hmm. it feels like they are getting closer and we could actually see maybe a prototype of a robo taxi on 88 um if they're hiring for those positions it certainly seems like it should be here in the next 12 months right so i think it's i think yeah. it's po- oh wait spec presentation and prototype yeah i yeah. think that's i think that's reasonable and by the way four and months- we've seen such big advancements in full self drive with this new beta release that's out that everyone's freaking out over the three of us, I did see one of the questions was, uh, have you guys gotten the, the new beta? So the three of us, so <laughs> as no, much as we like Tesla, none of us actually own a Tesla. I don't own a Tesla. I had lunch. 
I had lunch with one of our friends last week and he just texted me an hour ago and he says, oh, I forgot I wanted to show you uh, FSD because he has a Tesla. And he said that he he came out, this is Patrick, he came out from uh, like Rockwall mm -hmm. to downtown and he used FSD and only had to touch the wheel one time. That's pretty impressive. That's like a, that's a, yeah. that's like a 40 minute drive. And he only had to interrupt it one time, which is super impressive. I've seen a lot. I've seen way too many of the new FSD review videos on YouTube. Uh, it seems like it was a real, really big leap, but it's not there. It just, it's not there yet. It's impressive. Right. impressive. Yeah, it's, it's still not F, right? So it's still not the full. It's a lot, um, but it's not yeah. full. But I yeah, think it, that the... It, the change from this being a coded model to this being a kind of self-learning self-correcting model and they're doing the free trial of it for all tesla drivers where they have a if you have a compatible car they're just they're doing that so they can collect like a lot a, of data is it, a, is it a forced free trial or they they're just no i think i think you have to opt into it oh, you have to opt in okay i don't think your car just starts driving like your, your car just like backs itself out well, of no, the driveway says all right i'm ready to go <laughs> He he's going to pull it off. There's no doubt in my mind. And I'll go back to the China videos I've seen of the FSD in China. And th not, this is not Tesla. It's fully 100% functional and operating in heavy, aggressive city traffic in China. So there's no doubt in my mind this is happening. It, it will have the capacity to happen relatively soon. I'm going to go back to regulatory over and over and over again. I do not believe we will get over the regulatory hump for years. I don't think it's months. I think it's years. So I'm do not we even that have excited about what, what? Do we even have like a goalpost for regulatory? Is there no like a specific set of things that they have to do to be able to legally have? I mean, uh, Jordan, there are there are full self driving. Right. Yeah, taxis operating in select yeah, markets. Like Waymo, Waymo, you know, has one has has a. So fleet, there, right? there's They're, definitely a set of rules. Right, but but don't they have oh they have some pretty aggressive is that oversight. Just like a state rule? Do we we probably don't have federal guidelines? Is that like just a California? No, guideline? It, it's going to be Jordan. It's going to be city by city, um, right. town by town, and that's yeah. the problem. By the way, that's yeah. that's actually a huge problem. Um, that's why I see this. Yeah, you're going on a road trip. You're going on a road trip uh, doing this uh, modified, like, what is it? What are they calling it now where you have to, like, pay attention? But, but all of a sudden you get to a border and it's like, oh, my car just forgot how to drive. Yeah, I do. I do agree with people in the comments here that are like, OK, the stock will pull forward those earnings before. And I totally agree with that. Totally agree. Um, I, and I've always said, you know, I feel in my gut the time for Tesla, for me to get into Tesla heavy, feels like some point in the next year. I just don't know when exactly that is. It's, it doesn't feel like today, but I, it does feel like some point in the next year when people start to pull forward some of these earnings when FSD becomes that much more clear and we have more of at least a pathway to, to for what the regulatory might look like. But it feels like there haven't been a lot of those conversations happening around regulatory and it is very piecemeal so i'm concerned about it yeah but it will yeah, happen a lot of work right um but also let me say this i think a lot of the fsd you know, like if we had a set target we knew exactly what they had to do to get it to happen either nationwide or you know statewide then that would be fine but if if we don't even have those targets the problem is jordan that we also have a legacy automotive uh, sector in this country that will yeah. fight against it, okay? And they'll oh, fight sure. against it totally. in a really aggressive way, not just in this country, but all around the world. If and people... every vehicle on the road were self-aware and, you know, these things could be, you know, a car could tell another car where it is and what it's planning to do, like all of this will work in the future. But right now, your full self-drive Tesla also has to deal with grandma in the lane that may just decide to like cut you off and it has it's to not be bad. able to react and we've got people in the chat saying you'd be surprised at how good it is i'm i think it's fantastic with i think it's unbelievable what they've what they've been able to achieve 
And if we uh, want to experience it ourselves personally, Adrian says he will come pick us up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I want, no, I, I we'll believe it. We'll do a no, show no, no. from, from yeah. Adrian's Model X. Or my, guys, my, my, my objection or hurdle on FSD has never been yeah. about Tesla's tech. Uh, I'm a huge believer. It's always been about the regulatory challenges. Right. And I, you know, I wish they had kind of in behind the scenes, I wish they would have spent the last few years getting way more aggressive uh, with the top 20 or 25 cities pushing that forward. So we're not waiting for the tech to push it forward. I also do think that I was thinking about this the other day, how large is the FSD robo taxi market really? Because anyone that has a kid or multiple kids will tell you there is a zero chance that they are going to transition from their own car to robo taxis when they have one or more strollers and car seats and diaper bags that live in their car. There's just no zero chance that they will transition to a robo taxi model when you have kids. And, and let me say this, it's a large portion of America that has kids, okay? It's not like 5%. It's a large portion that has kids that need to be toting them around with all the stuff in the car. So I think it would be interesting to kind of have, I don't know if anyone's ever done this. I'm sure someone has to actually start to assess how realistically large the robo taxi market is in the U S if we fast forward 10 years, like past the regulatory challenges. Yeah. I'm I'm just curious how big it is. Now that said, I think FSD generally will take over a large portion of people that have cars. But the model, because I saw some tweets today about, you know, will, will Tesla stop selling cars? I was like, guys, this is starting to get ridiculous. Like there are tens of millions of people in the US that will require their own vehicle, FSD or not because of the car seat and the the strollers and all the stuff and the toys it's just like come on and the dog how about dog well i guess dogs are fine right like they'll let dogs in robo taxis no big deal but does anyone i don't hear people talking about that like that that is an impediment against like this full robo taxi vision of life that we have Right. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't see it getting to the point where n nobody needs to own their own car and only the ones that are fleet operators for robo taxis actually own the vehicle. I, I'll want my own. I, I, but preference, I just like my own even space. Preference, right. And like, like, so how large is the TAM truly? Right. And I am a believer in it. Long term, it will be a, a significant part of the automotive market significant okay um but not for years anyway i right. do not i do believe that he made that statement in defense of of tesla and it wasn't because he was so excited about how quickly it was coming along i think this was more of a ask for forgiveness later from your team he, he probably tweeted it out and yeah. then the team now has to figure out what exactly are we doing on 8.8 and how the hell do we get there? And listen, this is what you have to love about Elon is because Elon is now holding everyone accountable to figure it out. Figure it out. If we work yeah. 24 hours a day, we are going to present something on 8.8 that better wow people. And I love it. I love that he's doing that. Yeah, That's it's great having a goalpost you know, he's he staked his claim. Something is going to have to be visible to the public on 8-8. All right, let's run through uh, some some uh, questions from the live chat. If I, yeah. what happened to my yeah. chat window? There it is. Do you have any? Okay, so this first one uh, from, I went for a walk today. What kind of a username is that? Uh, what is the biggest position in robotics for each of you? And I'll say that mine is Tesla. That's my biggest position still. <laughs> As it keeps going down, it becomes a smaller percentage of my portfolio, but I'm still very much uh, a believer in Tesla as a robotics company. But then two private investments, um, Figure AI and uh, Aptronic. Those are, those are, that is the trio of my robotics. Third. Oh, you're not in the other one with us, just me and Jordan. Okay, so I'll, uh, mine is Aptronic's my largest, Figure AI's my second largest. Um, uh, 
Diligent Robotics is my third largest. I'm in Diligent Robotics too. Okay. I forgot about that. <laughs> I don't think, you're the robotics. I don't think of that. Yeah, I'm I'm in Diligent because I don't so I don't think of that as an AI play in? though. Which one are you not in? He was thinking I was I forgot about Diligent. Diligent. No, yeah, oh, he's which, is, Diligent. which is which is Moxie, the uh the nurse yeah, robot. robot. Yeah. Yeah, it's nursing and they're doing they seem to be doing really well. And then Tesla is my fourth. Now, I, I will say this. I anticipate, I anticipate just because of its position in public markets and my ability to leverage and have access to a liquid investment as opposed to the private investments where we have to be a little more careful because we can't just pull our money in and out. I do anticipate that in the next year, Tesla is likely to be my largest investment at some point in the next year. But currently it's my number four in, in robotics. Yeah. Jordan, are you just private, right? Uh, I'm in, I think I've got exposure to all four of those. Oh, okay. I forget, are you in Tesla now? Not a lot. Um, well, a he's in, he's in. Just enough to, just enough to keep it on my, uh, on my <laughs> screen, you know. <laughs> I, think I've got a little I like it. Instead, instead of a watch there, list, you just use yeah. actual stock. That's 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 my watch list. It's stuff that I buy. Yeah, I like it. All right. like I don't it. buy it. Yes. I don't watch it. And that's just that's a problem of mine. Uh, you could try to give me technology to solve it, but I, you know, I, that's how it works. No, well, you're more um, invested in it. It's like it's like um, right. betting on a football yeah. game. It makes you way more interested in the game's outcome. I get it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the problem is it anchors you, and that's you know that's an issue. But uh, you know. Okay, I'll I'll, Chris, I'll read off my. Yasera wants top. to know your top five positions right now. Okay, right now my top position uh, is still Amazon. Uh, my number two position. Amazon's is been Nvidia. killing it lately, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Amazon's doing good. I, I can't sell it because of the tax implications. Yeah, yeah. We've well, we said not to do that in the past, but they're just it's too big. Um, number two is Nvidia. Number three. This is an interesting one because it's been our number one stock that we've talked about pretty much for the last year, one of the top two or three. I sold most of my position at the very top, and I just very recently got back in pretty heavy, uh, Celsius Energy. So I really? remember I told you I exited like 80% of my Celsius, like right yeah. pretty close to when it was peaking. Um, and then it finally came down a bunch, and they had that news about Pepsi, where Pepsi changed the deal terms and it was asking for more money from Celsius, like they wanted more, and the market acted negatively to that. And I read that news and I was like, are you guys insane? Yeah. That's an unbelievably positive story because the only reason that Celsius would actually give Pepsi more is because Pepsi was offering to do something for them that Celsius wanted them to do. And I believe that what's happening is as Cel as Pepsi is seeing this international rollout with Celsius, they're starting to see opportunities to double and triple down on the mm -hmm. Celsius brand in expanding the SKUs beyond energy, maybe into hydration and a couple other areas that would be competitive with existing Pepsi brands, like I think Gatorade, right, or something like that. So like, I think that Pepsi is like, hey guys, we're sitting on a monster opportunity here, the beat monster at their own game, uh, but we're sitting on a big opportunity and we just listen. We you can't ask us to start to to aggressively promote new SKUs that go beyond energy that compete with Pepsi drinks unless we have a bigger stake here in the margins and how much we're getting paid. I think that comes out on the next earnings call. I hope it does. I think the next earnings call is going to be pretty wild for Celsius. But I did get back into Celsius uh, pretty heavily. Yes. The next two, Eli Lilly and Novo. You yep. know that, that those are like two of our big ones from the past year as well. And then after that, it's like Apple and a bunch of others that quite honestly, I'm not like super proud to talk about 
right now. So I'm glad that I only have to reveal the first five <laughs> because, you know, the other ones just all have a story that I'm not quite ready to, you know, have really talk about them. All right. Let's uh, talk small. about uh, the next question. Uh, what do you think about Take Two and Rockstar Games releasing GTA 6 next year? I and by the way, my account's getting crushed today. Jeez. Oh man. This, I, I'm upset I just had a look at that. Uh, so uh, uh GTA. Yeah, Let me say something about GTA. I am very concerned about GTA. Uh, and here's why. First of all, we all know it's been delayed, delayed, delayed. It's become the biggest joke of the gaming industry. So I think GTA is getting caught up in this really weird time where AI is about to take over video game programming to where mm -hmm. AI is going to become a really big part of future games. And GTA has spent the last, set, what, seven years writing script. Like when you're in GTA, you converse with other characters and they're going to be saying things that would have been appropriate in 2019 when they were coding that crap, okay? <laughs> First yeah. of all, that stuff is no longer... Culture shifts so quickly. GTA is a culture-focused game. And it is terrible that they've been working on this that long because a lot of that stuff is no longer relevant. They've now invested so much money in this game. It's obscene and the reality is that within a few years ai is going to be making these games right itself and but ai is going to become a really big part of the way people converse in the game so you're not conversing to like a script where you say this they are programmed but to don't you think they're going things. to put ai into maybe gta 7 and that's going to be the the turning point where that but game they, becomes it, that's interactive like 10 immersive. years from now. Who the hell cares? That's like 15 years from now. Does this it have game... to be though? You're talking about uh, update cycles based on humans doing all the work. No, 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 no. What I'm talking about is in-game interactions that are hard-coded, which is the old way of doing things. The way of doing things going forward in gaming and, and GTA has invested hundreds of bill, what, hundreds of, like an insane not hundred billion, but like hundreds of millions, excuse me, in this game that is old technology, that is outdated. And I just think it's going to be a letdown by the time they actually release this game. Because I think what gamers are going to come to expect a year from now is going to be very different from what we were expecting the last four, five, six years that this game has, you know, been coded and designed under. So I'm actually, I see it as a negative that they've taken this long. I think the hype cycle has gotten so big that they've set themselves up for failure. Will they still sell an insane number of games? Absolutely. It's not about that. It's about, can they, can they sell a lot of games and then sell a lot of updates, right, over the coming five years after that? And that's what I would be concerned about. I just think gaming is going to become more democratized because of AI. I think if you fast forward two or three years, the number of studios that will be able to leverage AI to print games that are stunningly interesting and dynamic thanks to AI will set a way more competitive landscape and companies like Rockstar won't have the inherent advantage of being able to invest hundreds of millions of dollars into a game where no one else can invest that. There's only a few studios willing to spend six years and that much money on a game. It's going to upend the problem. whole gaming studio system. But yeah. it's a matter okay. of time. It's Hollywood. It's think the about same Hollywood. thing that's happening in Hollywood, Dave. Look, yeah. look at it. And music, right? It's the same exact thing. Yeah. All right. You just posted a tweet the other day about a country song, right, Dave? That you. Oh, my God. This, it's, uh, it's, Udo, and you basically write a prompt, and it, it you don't even have to be descriptive. The the one that I found, someone else wrote the prompt, but it's like you know country ballad, uh, you know, and it's the funniest song ever. So, uh, Twitter dot com slash Dave Hanson, you can see my latest tweet because you can then 
like remix it and you can add extended verses. So like you can, you could just, it's the coolest thing ever, but yes, it, it creates a fully produced professional sounding, not mimicked based on any particular artist. Although I've been, I created a song that sounds very much like Willie Nelson sang it. Um, but it, it changes the music industry. So, so what we're seeing in music, what we're starting to hear about now in Hollywood with mass, with layoffs and with the deterioration of the value in actually spending a lot of money on a production, right? I think the same thing is going to happen to gaming. And I think that when we start to see this over the next one to two years, investors will look at companies uh like take two and by the way i've been trading take two since the day it went public okay i used to be a big take two trader i love historically i love the company um i think investors will look at these companies and go well why should why do they demand that much value if we're democratizing gaming programming through ai and you could have individuals at some point capable of making unbelievable games i think there will be a lot of noise in the market games like gta will always be big but will they have more competition ah it's just a thesis man that, that that's my thesis on take two i'm not in it i, I was just uh, going to see if i could use this to uh, create a uh, jingle for our show uh, but then i realized i don't have a way to patch that through to the system so <laughs> we're, we're we'll probably have a new theme song soon uh all right, next question. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on Path, which is UI Path uh, for a humanoid transition? That's a company I, I wasn't familiar with. How a few different people have sent me that name, and I just haven't gotten around to it yet. So it's like a no. one billion dollar market cap, uh, founded in Romania, it's, uh, based in New York City. I don't know enough um, about it to comment. Yeah, so sorry guys, I can't do the Kramer thing where I start making up stuff just to sound like I know what I'm talking about. It's the lightning round. <laughs> Chris makes up whatever he thinks based on the ticker symbol. All right. So, um, so Bob, okay, I will Ross say, I will say they. Yeah, I will say they it, they make robotic process automation software. I mean, yeah, I don't I don't know. There's a lot. There are a lot of companies getting into that space. It could be really big. I'll have to spend some time on it. Thanks for reminding me. Um, um, can we ask about now. Zins if we were uh, interested in the Zin trade? Oh, have seen, no. Have you seen Zins have basically taken over TikTok? Yeah. Um, but, and it's a huge trend. I think people are, A, switching from other smokeless tobacco to Zins. And also, I think it is attracting... Uh, people that did not use smokeless tobacco at all into using these Zens. You have it. So I, I, it's been on the Joe Rogan podcast. Um, it's been on several of these like kind of bro type podcasts. I do think that it's a benefit for Philip Morris uh, who owns Zen. Is it enough to make me want to invest in Philip Morris? No, it's a dying. I mean, literally. <laughs> business. Okay. Jordan, uh, here, here's the thing. And um, and, like and I think people assume that it's safe. I think people assume that the Zen is a safe alternative to tobacco. And I don't I have not even heard of this. I must not be on TikTok enough. Or, or oh, not Dave, this is, this is big. No, Zen, it, it, it's, it's huge. The problem is the investor base for Philip Morris <laughs> is well aware of this. It's, it's like the number one thing that everyone talks about. So I don't know that there's any opportunity to arb this unless... There's a thesis that exists that you just mentioned, Jordan, where it could theoretically expand the category beyond mm -hmm. uh, just making. I think it is. I think I've seen. I at least have seen videos of people that were not smokeless tobacco users before and have now started using the lip I pillows. Just, I can't. I'm having a hard time, Jordan, trying to envision that many people who are not tobacco, you know, smokeless tobacco right. people starting to stick something in their mouth. Like I, in terms of like, what is, I mean, it is highly addictive. We know so that it's a, it's a nicotine pouch. Yeah. Correct. It's, it's oh, this is so it, weird. Dave, it's basically, it's, it's the pouch version 
of uh you know smokeless not, not so smokeless their, like their website free. won't even let me in without providing id this is i i know people have been talking about this for a while philip morris i see it mostly as just a replacement for the business that they're losing right and so I just don't know. I think it's baked in. I it feel I spent some time on it and I walked why would, away. Why would feeling, there be any different than like nicotine gum? Like, is there just, it seems more gross than chewing some gum that has nicotine in it, right? I mean, this is Jordan's demographic. Well, wait, know. what was the question? Um, well, so the dosage what makes this different than, than nicotine gum? Yeah, the dosage is going to be higher, I think. Um, you can so just like get... chew like six pieces at the same time. That's sure. disgusting. Yeah, okay. totally. Hundred yeah. percent. No, I'm not saying that it's a good compared idea, to maybe. putting some pouch in your mouth. It, it, yeah, they it, put, it's they, the pouch version of vaping. It's all it is. It's the Ugh. pouch version of vaping, right? All right. So, so I'm out vaping, on that as an investment and as a product. Yeah, vaping yeah. got really big, but at the end of the day, like I just don't, I don't see it expanding the market that much beyond their existing customer base. I could be wrong, at least not to the extent that their investors are not already anticipating that. Because it seems to be like the thing that they're all focused on at Philip Morris. So <laughs> Michael Michael Crockett says Zens are awesome, which, you know, he's, dude. I, all I can think of with him is when we, uh, this is Chris's old roommate who definitely loved chewing tobacco. He, he, Crockett, and I love you, man. I, I do. I do love you. And I will always love you. But when he lived in my back house with me in college and he I, I I'll never forget. This is my parents back house walking in and he <laughs> dipped right in tobacco and he spit on my carpet and rubbed it in. It might have been with his bare foot. Crockett, you were. I, I, I still can't fit. I still can't get over it. I, I still can't believe that that was normal. That's just what you thought was okay to do back then. So look, here's the, here's the problem. Cro Crockett, Crockett, if you want to come on to the show to defend yourself, you can, but I think that, uh, so, and, and by the way, not happy with you at this point. <laughs> I wrote about, I wrote about Crockett in my book, laughing at wall street. We were roommates. He actually got me my first job in finance at Dean Witter, cold calling, selling municipal bonds in college. Uh, but, Crockett is the demographic for this, right? He is the demographic, but he's also a guy that's been dipping tobacco since he was like, he's from West Texas, okay? He's from, since he was like probably 12 years old, okay? Mm -hmm. At least when he was living with me when he was 18. So, <laughs> but, but Crockett, you're the demographic. Like, <laughs> how many of you are there outside of your demographic that are going to start chewing non tobacco? pouches i i just don't i don't see it i don't see it wait is it non-tobacco what is it it's just like nicotine. is it like a flavored like product vaping is it... in your in a pouch vaping in a pouch it, okay dave vaping was non-tobacco smoking right they just nicotine in a cigarette base that's a vape but but without the smoke right like yeah it's just it's a nicotine delivery system right it, this is just a different delivery system for that it's you just keep it in your yeah, so yeah, if you're playing baseball, I guess it makes sense. <laughs> or if you're or if you're it. Crockett. I'm not and guys, maybe I don't maybe I don't get it. <laughs> but I did research it and I just don't okay. Teenage maybe teenagers do it. I don't know, man. I but are more people going to do it than Philip Morris investors are already anticipating are going to do it? That's the question. I, I'm not sold on that. I'm really not. We'll see. All right. What Bob else? Ross. I, I, I tried to get to this one earlier. Uh, you pick up Abigail. Oh, oh yes. Okay. We're, we've hit our one hour mark. It, at least you were here for the uh, tobacco, for the <laughs> tipping section. <laughs> for the non-tobacco uh, lip uh, lip pillow product? Yeah. All right, Dave, yeah, let's I, run through I, the rest I am not buying Philip Morris based on... It, even though I do think it could be beneficial to Philip Morris, um, it's not my not my thing. All right, Jordan, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, leave, uh, I think I think everything's fine. Yeah, you're. I'll you're just leave uploading. the browser open um, after I leave. All right, perfect.
Yep. All right. Bye. Have a good weekend, Jordan. All right, you too. Take care. Bye, man. Later. All right. Uh, so, Jordan, you can just pop in anytime you want, Jordan. Okay, so I had started this one. We I we tried to talk about it earlier before the the whole Zen thing. Uh, are you still bullish on on? Yeah, I, on I running, am. Choose. But to be honest, like on is the type of company where I will do my research on on mid quarter and see how yeah. they're doing. I haven't done that yet because I'm still have I still have PTSD over the insane amount of money that I lost on that trade last earnings when I basically lost all of my money on those options and then they recovered the next day. It's just, it just happens. Um, I don't want to think about that company for at least another month. I can't, I just can't. It's just too PTSD. But yeah, I, I am definitely still generally bullish on on and I have heard that the foreign currency headwind that was a real issue for them last quarter has started to reverse itself. So that could be interesting this quarter, but I still need to validate that the trends are moving in the right direction uh, with sell through of their products and expansion of their product line. I've also seen some pretty good data on Hoka so it looks like On and Hoka are still kind of moving in the right direction. And yes, if I don't continue to lose the obscene amount of money I'm losing every day due to this market, uh, I might get back into both of them before earnings, but not today. Yeah. Today's I'm not the day. I'm not, in, I'm not on, on right now um, I, for for no real reason other than I'm kind of like you. It's kind of, we're, we're in between the cycle of anything yeah. exciting happening and it's not a place that I just, park money because they're... i'll check in the next few weeks I'll, I'll dip back into my research on on and i'll let everyone know the first place i'll let people know and i i, I do apologize i've been out of the loop for a few weeks is on our discord dumbmoney.tv forward slash discord which is totally free in the trade research channel ideas channel of the discord uh following up on shoe uh brands i did see a question uh from BB here, are you uh, looking at earnings for Crocs? And I am still in Crocs, even though it has taken a bit of a turn lately. I have not looked at Crocs in a bit because I was super disappointed with the deterioration of growth, or the at least my perceived deterioration of growth in their Hey Dudes brand. We've talked about this a few times on the show. Uh, hey Dudes got kind of caught in a niche demographic. And to the best of my knowledge, I haven't seen any signs that they've been able to break out of that um, kind of spiral the last couple months. So I'll take another look at Crocs, but you can't trade Crocs without paying attention to Hey Dudes. And Hey Dudes have been the problem yeah. the last few quarters. I, they, I don't they... even know what earnings are. Yeah, they, uh, earnings look like they come out in May. Let's see if I can get a date. So we, here. Have, we have a little time. I'll get on all this stuff before earnings hit. May second, ish. Yeah, I, I'll get, trust me. There will be a point in the next couple of weeks when I start going deep on all the consumer research. I'll pull all the web traffic numbers, transactional credit card data numbers. Um, I'll look at kind of the social trends and I'll report it all in our, in our discord for you guys. And while you're doing that also uh, look at trends for elf beauty, because that's uh that's one. Yeah. That I'll look at elf as well. Everyone loves to hear about. Dude, this market, man. Uh, by the way, Bitcoin's getting crushed again today. I, I do feel, I want to talk about this in today's show. Yeah. I do feel that the April 15th tax deadline could be part of the reason for this downtrend this week. I know that I had to pull out an insane amount of money the last few days to pay my taxes on Monday. So I'm curious because of the way the market reacted last year, if we have a lot of people that are now having to pay gains because didn't Dave, the, the bulk of the market move last year came in, was it Q4? Am I right? If I just look at the, 
if I look at the SPY, here's the SPY the one year, here. Yeah, this is, I, I should have known better. So guys, what I'm referring to is if you have a lot of gains that are happening over the course of the year, people tend, you know, they'll, they'll prepay their taxes based on that, right? And they'll kind of reserve things for taxes there. They'll, they'll sell, they'll, they'll kind of be consciously thinking about that. What we, ha what happened last year was after basically an entire 18, what, 18 month period of flatness. We had this massive rally that started no late November, or was it early early November? Early November, massive, yeah. Massive yep. rally uh, through the end of the year, and I think a lot of people ended up having gains there that they're now having to pay taxes on, and they didn't realize, and now they're having to sell stock this week to pay the IRS. This is this could be a big part of this move today. Um, it, it is for me. I, I, I wired, I had a wire in multiple chunks between my brokerage account. Cause I, I hit the capacity of what they would allow me to move over on a day. And I still have to move more feeling. money on Monday. Uh, I actually ended up having a uh, negative uh, adjusted gross income for the year. Thanks to some private investments that uh, disappeared and out of thin air during the year. Yeah, that helped well, I'm, me. I'm not. Bit I'm not paying time. any taxes this year. Yeah, <laughs> that's the only <laughs> time you, you you can look back and be like, oh, at least I get a tax break. Yeah, I just I wrote my check to a private company instead of to the IRS. That's yeah. that's the way I look at it. it yeah, it sucks. Uh, and we all learn from it, and we get smarter. And it's it's like charity for the for for the world, Dave. Right? I mean, it's what else? It's, it is what it is. All right. Um, what else do we have? Oh, this, this one is actually an interesting, uh, thing to think about. Uh, can you comment on the market size of self-driving versus humanoid? So this is kind of like a, a Tesla question, but more of a big picture question for just markets in general. Yeah. Humanoids happen first because it's a commercial use case that doesn't require any regulatory approvals. So what we're going to see this next year are pilots that I'm assuming Tesla will be part of, uh, and they'll be private pilots, right? Inside of companies, inside of warehouses, manufacturing facilities, Mercedes, BMW. Uh, and then those pilots will slowly start to expand and nobody needs to ask for permission to do that. And that's the biggest difference between, uh, you know, AI powered robotics and AI powered vehicles uh fsd i've always said that's the biggest difference maker i think because of that we'll probably start to see this is my thesis we'll probably start to see a bigger impact uh coming from the optimist division at tesla as opposed to fsd i think fsd happens after uh we start to see traction in the humanoid optimist division at tesla now, so do you think do you think that uh elon's prediction that there will be a billion humanoid robots by 2040s do you think that's yeah. at all possible yes I a do. billion i think it's possible by 20 by saying. 2040 that that does give a long ramp up yeah, period it's, it's 14 years i said this before i think i don't think we have a million humanoids in the world until 2030 so i think i think the next six years it's really slow i was just talking about this a couple of days ago in miami i want to say that based on what i know about these humanoid companies right now we're talking about dozens of humanoids this year a small very small chance the end of this year we could see could could get into the hundreds collectively between all the non-chinese humanoid companies uh, next year, we're, we are definitely in the hundreds and potentially collectively globally could be over in the low thousands uh, next year between all the non-Chinese humanoid companies in the thousands. Uh, 2026, I think we are in the tens of thousands of humanoids operating in the world, still fairly small scale, but I think it's tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands 
then we kind of hundreds of thousands. And from there, it starts to get really big really quick. I At think point it's going think to be it, really it goes from from being an industrial only manufacturing uh, world to the the real world use case of having one in your home, like a retail robot. Well, with advanced AI the, that can do stuff for you around the house. There's one European humanoid company that is solely focused on home humanoids. Uh, I think it's going to be a real challenge. I think we maybe start to see some in the home a few years from now, but I just don't think that really happens to the 2030s. And I think even then it's going to be fairly experimental uh, only because the humanoids are large and heavy and there might be a little bit of liability. I think we'll see it. I could be wrong. We could be 2027. 26, 27, we could start seeing some experimentation with home humanoids. I'm just trying to figure out who the companies are, Dave, because I know the companies that were invested in, including Tesla, I don't know that they would want to distract themselves with home humanoid. I just don't see that. I think they have big dollars sitting in front of them to figure out this commercial humanoid problem. And I don't see them wanting to get distracted by putting them in the home. I just don't see it. You know, like I, I think, think it's I like, think Tesla will be the will be the first to have a home humanoid at, I, at scale. I agree. I agree with that. I I agree with that. But do you think Tesla, if they are only to able to manufacture so many, and they know that the key to those commercial contracts are embedding themselves in the Fortune 500 type companies? and you only have one chance to embed yourself in those companies. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is based on how many you can produce and deploy and onboard and get into that cycle of reinforced learning, doing those tasks. And it's not like there's one task. Each of these companies has dozens and dozens of tasks. And a lot of those tasks are reliant upon more advanced AI, uh, and again, reinforcement learning. So that takes tremendous resources yeah. out of a company like Tesla, human resources to do that and strategy. I don't know that when Tesla's looking at this multi-trillion dollar market, do they say, oh, we wanna also be in the home? That's like a big thing to deal with, to get these things in the home. When you look, think about, there's just this huge corporate refocusing on that. I don't yeah. see it. Well, and to, to follow up on this question, uh, they won't sell to consumer first. I'm not saying that they'll sell to consumer no. first. I'm saying that they will be the first to sell to consumer or at least have a product offering for consumers before others have consumer product. Dave, offering. I think I think we see other, I, I'm already starting to see, I've already met with a couple people. I, I, I'm seeing some rumblings of new startups that are humanoids that are focused on the home. Uh, I do think we start to see some smaller companies doing niche things in the home with humanoids. I don't think they're going to be scaling, though, before Tesla does. When yeah. Tesla decides to go in the home, I think they go in the home fairly large and they go from zero, you know, zero to 60 in the first 18 months they decide to make that happen. So, um, yeah. Humanoids first. Um, what exactly are you waiting for, Chris, uh, to start entering into your Tesla position at scale? Um, I would rather get in Tesla a little bit late than a little bit early. My cost of capital is really high. So when you're generating, I've been fortunate. Uh, last year, I generated close to 200% returns total portfolio. So if I have money, I don't want money sitting in a stock for three, six, nine, 12 months waiting for something to happen, waiting for the world to start to appreciate what I think is going to happen. Uh, I would rather be a little bit late when people start to appreciate it. And then I'm, I get that confidence that, okay, Optimus is now like kind of fully arriving. The company's willing to engage Wall Street and the public with what they're doing with Optimus. It's further along. Analysts are starting to include this in some of their projections. I know that when that happens, Tesla, you know, will have already moved, and I'm I'm okay with missing out 
on 20, 30, 40, $50, $60 in movement on Tesla. I also think that there's a reasonable chance that these next couple quarters are going to be even worse than people anticipate. I think that's a big part of the 8-8 announcement is that 8-8 announcement kind of gets people to look over what's going to happen next, which is bad. Mm -hmm. And listen, this is not an awesome market right now. I think Tesla could come down. I was talking to a huge Tesla bull in Miami and this guy thought he could, they could come down to like 40 or 50. <laughs> and, and so I have no idea. No one can predict that. I just don't know. I just think there's a chance they can go down. I think there's a chance they can be flat for a while. And I generally tend to time my investments as precisely as possible as a social arb investor. So I can't have money sitting out there not doing anything. Do you have a uh, bear case argument for the general adoption of humanoids? Yes. My, my bear case argument is that, you know, the best one I've been able to find at least is that multi-use AI powered robotics becomes more of the mainstream adopted use case. And what I mean by that is rather than having a humanoid to do everything, you know, maybe you have this thing that you put on top of your sink that literally just, it's an arm basically. And this arm is perfect at like doing your dishes. I don't know, but like you have that, I don't want to have a dishwasher. Use. No, no, I don't want to talk about home. Use. This is probably not good for home use. So yeah. Getting back to commercial, like you can make a case that you can solve a lot of the problems for commercial use cases with AI powered robotics that are not necessarily bipedal humanoids. And you could make these things cheaper. And maybe each of these things does six or seven or eight things as opposed to 10,000 things. That's an ongoing debate in the robotics world. And it's it's one that I lean heavily in favor of the humanoid form factor because you're able to make one thing and deploy it for any use case and it gives you maximum flexibility. So one example is my restaurant. I would love to have a humanoid in six or seven years that can prepare the food, cook the food side by side with our chef and then also clean the kitchen and then also you know, clean the restaurant after we shut down. And then the next morning when we get our 200 boxes of vegetables and meat, can identify what that is, scan it all into our system, open all the boxes, put everything in the walk-in fridge in all the right places, um, do all of that work, and then take it out to the dump, take all the empty boxes out to the dumpster, right? So I love the concept of even in a factory setting, having maximum flexibility of your workforce, the same way you do today, right? With humans. So I don't know. And, and I like the ability to just produce one thing, right? To produce one thing and focus on it. I think it's inevitable that that's where we're headed. So I don't think multi-use robotics will become the primary. I think it has a place, but I, I lean towards humanoids. All right. I, I just wanted to uh, point out that we have now uh, hit the point where we have more viewers on X than we do on YouTube live. That, that's wild. I, I know people like to rip on X and I, I think X has lost. I know they've lost people the last year due to Elon and some of the politics. I have I have friends that are no longer on X and I hate that. But I do think that X has become a great place for finance. Uh, it's a great place for finance. It's a good place for discussions. There's still the spam problem. There's still, and Elon has recently said that they're about to flip the switch on a new upgrade that is trying to deal with that. Dude, right it's now, so bad, dude. Reading the comments is kind of a wasteland of like, oh, yeah, you'll find a few interesting nuggets in there, but uh, there's so much that it's just like reposting off topic stuff, all the click farming posts. Yeah. Yeah, no, to totally. It's terrible. It's the worst I've ever seen it. It's it's the absolute worst, and he needs to fix it. But it's the, I, I, I'm glad to see the finance community still strong on X. 
And I think that um, the the whole live streaming to X, we, we get way more like who tune in live because they actually surface it as a, oh, look, there's an event. Someone you follow is doing a live stream. We should probably so here, individually live stream it to our personal accounts too, just to get more visibility there. But right now we have like 1,400 people watching on X live and just 775. It's not Can double, I see their comments or no? Their comments? They, they so their comments up. don't come through. So the, the way that it, the integration works, I don't think that you can have like a live yeah. comment that at least makes it into our system. All the comments, all the questions and things that we've been uh, talking about go through. Uh, but let me just write hello. Uh, so someone was asking, what do you have set up? What investments do you have set up for your kids? They actually look pretty similar to mine. My kids currently are mostly in nvidia right now oh their accounts are down today <laughs> so i i just figured out that i you can actually participate in the live chat from x you just have to instead of listening only or having it in the top you just open it and then you you see us and then there is a comment box that you can write into i think days like today are good days just to walk away from them. We should probably not do shows on days like today day, by the way, but it's a good day to remind <laughs> yeah. everyone. I that... saw, I saw another question. People are asking uh, how much are you down today and how do you, how do you deal I, with that? Um, it, a lot. I, 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 how do I deal with it? It, it, it doesn't impact me that much because when you've seen it year in and year out for 30 years, it's just part of it. It's part of the process. And I think the one thing we've talked about on big down days it helps you understand where you're over leveraged. What I did today was I realized, hey, I don't need to be in some of these other stocks where I don't have high conviction at these levels. And I sold 50 to 70% of a bunch of stocks that I kind of, so sometimes Dave, if I start to research a company, I'll just buy an opening position in them. Yeah. Right. And then I'll figure out later on if I want to keep it or sell it. I had a whole bunch of those in my portfolio. And I'm like, now I have market risk that I really don't want. I'm bar borrowing a ton of money on margin. Um, it's not like the old days where I can borrow money on margin and pay like 2% or 1.8%. I'm paying like 7.5% or something like that on margin. This is costing me a crap load of money. And I don't need to be paying that much interest on something that I don't have high conviction in. So days like today are healthy because you're able to go through your portfolio and go, okay, do I really need to own this stuff? Probably not. Let's let's not let's not yeah. be stupid here. So it's a good so day I, for spring you know, cleaning. Yeah, I, and I did a lot of that today, and part of it was because I had to free up cash for taxes, and I think that's a big part of why we're seeing this market move. I really do. I'm not saying everyone's in the same position as me because I had a huge year last year. But I think a lot of people are having to liquidate this week for taxes next next week. There's no doubt in my mind yeah. that that's part of this. Um, any other good questions, Dave? Before we the I uh, we've gotten to all the ones that I had uh, flagged earlier. They're they're still coming in. Any new stock investments coming? That, that's the that's the reason you need to watch the channel because we when we have something we'll talk about it. But we we don't have anything right now that we're super excited about. Yeah, so I, I, I think that about. I also think the thing to take away from today's episode is, you know, don't don't this weekend, don't go watch five hours of finance YouTube about inflation and the market. Is it going to make you any money? No, it's not going to make you any money. It's just stop it. It's just stop. It's a trap that we all fall into. And I think that's the one thing I'd love people to take away from today's episode spend time with your kids, your family, your friends. And then if you're going to spend a few hours doing something related to finance, get in, get on TikTok. Like look for what's trending. Like start looking Don't watch at finance YouTube, friends. watch TikTok. <laughs> no, but I mean, what I'm saying is look, start to pay attention, more attention to what's changing in the world. Like I still I'm trying feel... to find the next trend before anyone else has discovered it. And TikTok still is that place where, where things are surfaced before before they show up in older medium. I feel that there's still one or more AI trades that we're missing. I I, I just I just know there is. 
And it takes a lot of work and research to figure that stuff out. Get you know the dumb money Discord is awesome because there are a lot of people floating ideas. So if you don't know where to start, this is what I do. I go into our trade research ideas channel of the dumbmoney.tv forward slash discord. And I'll just spend an hour reading through people's ideas. And we have honestly some of the best social arb traders in the world in that discord. And they just have ideas. They're like, hey, I think that this brand is starting to trend, or I think that this could be an opportunity. I just go through it and, and I start to do my own research and work. And usually I find something in there of interest that I agree with. That is time better spent than watching a bunch of people talking about Jay Powell and interest rates and, you know, the end of the world. And, you know, should I sell all my stocks or just like stop it? By the way, I do want to see Civil War this weekend. It's out, right? Uh, yeah, they're, they're promoting it on all the talk shows. So I assume it's out this weekend. Can can we watch can it? Can we just home? have that? Uh, I know. Can we just get it on streaming? I don't want to go to a movie theater to watch a movie. Do you just just make me pay fifty bucks or whatever, forty bucks. I'm happy to do it. I just I would spend at least forty or fifty if I went to the theater with, with my wife or whatever. Like so, and we're not doing that. Just yeah. charge us what you want to charge us and let us watch it from home. It's ridiculous. There's a there is a movie coming to uh, Apple TV. Also, that I, I can't remember what it is, but it it looked good, so I, I might be watching that instead. I I have yeah. I oh, do you know what I do you know what I learned, Chris? What? You and I are going to dinner together tonight. In pretty soon, dude, and like <clears throat> it's an early dinner. How are we getting old? That that was an early reservation. We just do early. I I don't eat late. I don't eat after like six. <laughs> Oh my God, we, we we are we are that age now, dude. It's fine by me, by the way. I'm totally fine with it. <laughs> I'm a hundred percent fine with it. People will be having their like happy hour drinks, and we'll be full fledged eating our dinner. <laughs> I'm, I'm good with it, though. Um, Nothing wrong with that. Do you know why I'm good with it? Because I got to get home to watch the Mavs at seven thirty. Now, let me say this: we are not promoting gambling. We are not promoting gambling. But I will say this. I am dying to put some money on the Mavs to win it all this year. Like I'm so pissed off because I think they were it was 30 to 1 odds like a month ago and that's when I started to believe that they had a solid shot at taking it all, Dallas Mavericks. If I were in Vegas or a place that allowed me to gamble, I'd be putting some a decent chunk of money on the Dallas Mavericks to take it all this year. I really think it's possible. Really? And I think they're still paying like 22 or 23 times your money to take that bet. I just, I can't do it. They won't let you do it here. I can't Are none it. of the like FanDuel sites, you, none of them work here? I think, I think there's ways to get around it, but I'm just too lazy to deal with all that. I do have a friend in Vegas that offered to place a bet for me, so I might go through him, but um, <laughs> I'm telling you, Dallas Mavs. Uh, All right, we'll continue. We'll continue this conversation over dinner. Let's let's wrap the show up because we're we're now at the hour and a half, closing in on in the hour and a half mark. So we're going to uh, thank you guys so much for sticking with us all the way to the end. Look at this, like almost twenty three hundred people still listening and watching live. That's yeah. fantastic for a fright for a random Friday show where the market is red and nobody's happy and they just wanted to to see what we're up to. I guess. Oh, Dave, one last thing before we leave. Did you see this random Twitter account that did a thread on social arb investing and like with included a ton of my video clips? And yeah, I saw that. You didn't yeah, like you don't know who that is? No, got 4.4 4 million views. That's I just that's, I assumed it was the uh the the uh channel that interviewed you no, that they actually put some older this, clips in too. It's at P E D M A seven. I, I don't. I still don't know who this person is, but thank you, P Pedma. Thank you for doing that. I mean, I've had so many people reach out this week that I haven't heard from in twenty or twenty-five years. That said, uh, you just popped up on my Twitter feed, and I, I, I woke up to text messages on Sunday. It's <laughs> like, what? What are you talking about, dude? 
And by then it was already up to like 2 million views in the first three hours, three or four hours. So I do appreciate when people spread the message of social arb. I, I could care less about the me part of it. But what I thought was really cool, Dave. It's is, about social arb. It's about yeah, the philosophy. 12 years, we've been doing this. Yep. And finally, other people are start now helping us spread the word because this sort of investing does resonate with regular people. You know, you don't have to have a financial, you know, backing background or, you know, pedigree in finance or mathematics. The more regular person you are, probably the more suited you are to be a great social arb investor because it's all about just, you know, engaging in life and connecting dots, right? The more That's you it. live your life in the real world instead of buried in the finance world or trying to be a quant programmer, yeah. the more the more I, likely you are to discover something before we discover it. And we're Dave, actively eight, looking for it every day. 18,000 bookmarks, someone just said on that tweet. 18,000 bookmarks, wow. it's wild. Um, that said, on days like today, we all lose. And I promise you, for most of you watching the show today, however horrible your account looks, mine probably looks way, way worse. So I feel your pain. And there's no pretending this has been a miserable day. Um, no, it, and on it, top of no, that, there's no way around it. Uh, the Dow down 475, the SP, its worst day since January as inflation mm -hmm. woes erupt. In, uh, who writes these headlines? Inflation, inflation <laughs> woes are erupting. Come What's on, just, worst just chill out. It's this is not the way to go into the weekend with like red alerts coming in from CNBC. And now we're going to an expensive dinner, right? But the worst part is that this all happened in this on the same day or week that I'm having everyone's having to pull money out to pay taxes. Oh, no, I, I think there's probably a correlation there because I would I would be in the same boat pulling money out, having to sell some stock or go more into margin debt to pay my taxes had I not had such a big loss in a private company. Oh, it hurt. It hurts bad. I just want everyone to know that I feel your pain, man. It hurts so freaking bad, <laughs> but but it will go away. The, the, It'll the, go away. The, the inflation might not go away, but we'll listen, we will figure out how to deal with it. And at the end of the day, great companies always win, man. Great companies always win. There's never been one time in my life where that statement has not been true. So forget about the government and just focus on great companies. That's great companies win and changes in technology brings opportunity. We're entering the Dude. AI revolution. The I, companies I, I, that I can maximize that are in, in they're they're just in the best place. It sounds it sounds redundant, but you're right, Dave. The new the new thing is intelligence. The intelligence industry will be the largest industry we've ever witnessed as humans, and we just have to figure out the best ways to invest in it. That's it. I'm not even. What about World War Three? Come on, we're not. We're going into the weekend. We don't need that. <laughs> I got to see this movie, Dave. I, 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 I don't want to hear that. I don't want to see any of these. Yes, this is what we're going to end on, Chris. Saying <laughs> thank you and have a Laptop good weekend. Closed. By the way, <laughs> we're done. <Good> money. <laughs> <Good luck. laughs> As you do that, you just like your entire feed just goes away. All right, we're done. All right. We'll Later. see you. Uh, have a, have a fantastic weekend. We'll see you back here next week.